This is your daily dose of all things royal. Welcome back, my gorgeous, good-looking friends. So we all know that it has been ordered for DHS to turn over records to this judge, Carl Nichols, and he is going to be reviewing them. And this is supposed to happen on or before March 21st. What I wanted to do here is read the actual court case that happened uh, back on February 23rd. So we all can be on the same page. I know that there had been a lot of news articles about it, but the stories varied. And I told you that I wasn't going to talk about it until I saw exactly what was being said in the actual court case. So what I've done for everyone here, if interested, not everybody has to watch it, but if you're interested, I went ahead and read the full transcript to the recent hearing that happened between DHS and the Heritage Foundation. What I found so interesting is that there are gaps that these folks have pointed out and question marks that I don't think many people have picked up on. I'm going to let you listen to it and judge for yourself. Perhaps maybe you might connect some dots that some are not connecting, which I already have, but I'm keeping to myself for the time being because I want to see what everybody has to say. But by seeing the full um, discussion going back and forth, it is apparent that there is something very fishy going on here. And I think that the fagaziness lies on the nefarious duo. And I think a big reason for why we're seeing this shift of Meghan and Harry now thinking about going back to the UK and desperately wanting to be a working royal again is because they're going to get found out. There's stuff that's going to come out of here. So if you sit through and watch this, you'll start to put two and two together and understanding what I mean. At the very end, I do talk about what I sense might be happening and what we might see once this stuff is revealed. But I do think that all parties involved are not innocent. And uh, there are... Now, before you get into this video, I just want to set the expectation with everyone that this is me reading this transcript straight through. And what I've done here to my best ability is I have tried to alter my voice or you know, shift my voice in a way that you can hear or differentiate the various individuals that are speaking. But I've also included throughout the transcript the photos of the actual people that are speaking. In the case of John Bardo, who is speaking on behalf of DHS, there was no picture of him. So the caveat is I put Alejandro Mayorkas face up on there because he is the head of DHS. Hopefully that doesn't confuse you too much. But if you can't make it through the hour long, you know, maybe come back, do it in chunks. I think the most important part of this video is towards the end because there are some things that all of a sudden you can see the judge and the light bulb go on when certain things are mentioned. But now I wanted to do this because I think it's super important for us to make sure that the facts are straight. There are a lot of things that I don't think these folks that haven't been on this journey from the very beginning know. And I think that where we can fill some gaps is if we understand what it is that the direct source understands in order to help or in some way paint the picture as accurately as possible. And I know that many reporters or people that had been in the courtroom that day had witnessed the court hearing directly themselves, but they don't have the history that we have. So the reporting was inaccurate based off of what I saw. So I'm presenting this to you to make sure that you have the facts straight and that we can continue on to making sure that justice is served and we get to the truth because that's what we deserve. And a side note, for those that suffer from insomnia, I think that this particular video might be of some assistance. <laughs> so now, before you get comfortable with the cozy beverage and snack, please don't forget to help the kid out and hit that like button so it can help with sharing this video out more because I think 
Truth is so important, and we need people to be able to make up their own minds and critically think. Get comfortable, sit back, and enjoy. Counsel, please come forward and introduce yourselves for the record, beginning with the plaintiffs. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Sam Dewey for the plaintiffs. Mr. Dewey. With me are Dan Mahler, also counsel, Neil Cornett, and Dr. Niall Godiner from the Heritage Foundation as the client rep. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Your Honor. John Bardo on behalf of the Department of Homeland Security. I'm joined at counsel table by my Deputy Civil Division Chief, Peter Baffenfroth. Good afternoon as well. We are here principally on the party's cross motions for summary judgment. I'm going to treat this as a typical oral argument. I'm going to start with the government. I just want to say a couple of things, really. Just one thing at the beginning, which is I'm not privy to any of Prince Harry's immigration information. I haven't asked for it to be submitted in camera. I haven't asked for any explanation of it to be submitted in camera. So everyone should take every question I ask as a hypothetical based on the arguments that have been presented to me, many of which assume a set of facts. I'm going to be exploring those to some extent, but I just don't know the answers to many of the questions I'll be asking because I have not ordered, as I said, the disclosure of the information even to me or the declarations to me. And part of the reason I did that, in addition to not knowing whether it's appropriate to do so, is I wanted to be able to have a hearing where I could ask hypothetical questions without risking disclosing the very information that the government says it is unable to disclose. So no one should read anything into my questions to suggest that I know the answers to what happened with Prince Harry's immigration information. So with that, why don't we begin with the government? And we have cross motions. I don't think we need to argue the motion separately. They are obviously targeting at the same set of issues. What I would really like to hear from you, Mr. Bardo, is the government's main arguments. I'll have a series of questions. I'll then go to the plaintiff's counsel for their argument. Perhaps a short rebuttal from the government and then short sir rebuttal as warranted from plaintiff's counsel, okay? That's fine, Your Honor. Go ahead. Yes. Your Honor, the government, in response to the plaintiff's broad request for immigration information regarding Prince Harry that's stored within various components of the Department of Homeland Security, has issued a partial categorical withholding as well as a partial Glomar response. These are all based on Exemption 6 and Exemption 7C. Those are the personal privacy exemptions, Exemption 7C being the law enforcement one. The reason for the categorical withholding and the partial Glomar is none of the information that we have can be released without acknowledging what Prince Harry's immigration status is or tipping our hand as to what it is. That's the type of information that's consistently been held by courts to be the type of information that can be withheld under the personal privacy exemption, and we have an obligation to withhold that information. Is plaintiff right? Uh, And it feels very uncomfortable to me to refer to him as Prince Harry because that sounds very informal. People wouldn't call me Judge Carl, but I'm not sure there's a really more formal last name that he goes by. I could call him the Duke. I can call him the Duke of Sussex. Why don't we call him the Duke of Sussex? That feels less inappropriately informal to me. All right. Is heritage right that for the Duke of Sussex to enter the United States, he would have had to answer the question at some point whether he had used illegal drugs? Not necessarily, Your Honor. There are several ways in which he could have been admitted into the United States lawfully. That could be he could have had a waiver. He could be here on a Category A visa, or this could... Remind me, I know you could say that. A Category A visa is... That's a diplomatic visa, Your Honor. This could also... That's not really plausible at this point, is it? It's possible. I asked whether it was plausible. Yes, we would argue that it is plausible, Your Honor. You think it's plausible that the Duke is, notwithstanding all of his issues documented in his book, is here as a diplomat for the UK? Your Honor, I haven't studied the standards exactly, 
what's required to be to be a recipient of a diplomatic visa, but we, it, it is certainly plausible. Okay, you say he might have sought a waiver. I understand that. If he sought a waiver, he would have had to tell the government why he was seeking the waiver. And would that have disclosed to the government? Again, this is all if. If he sought a waiver, he would have had to say why he was seeking a waiver. And would that have not either disclosed the answer to the question I asked you, whether he would have to answer, or can you ask for a waiver without disclosing the reason for the waiver? My understanding, Your Honor, is he would have had to answer that question in that circumstance. Okay. So at some point, at least, the Duke, to enter the U.S., either had to answer the question whether he had engaged in drug use or would have had to have a Category A diplomatic visa or would have had to seek a waiver of the kind articulated in the party's briefs. But that itself would have disclosed past drug use, yes? Yes, I believe that's correct, Your Honor. Okay. Are there any other ways he could have entered the United States? I cannot think of any off the top of my head, but there could be others. Well, you're here representing the United States. I need to understand your understanding of the INA and whether there are other ways that the Duke could have entered the United States, at a minimum without answering that question, but those are the only ways I'm aware of, Your Honor. Okay. So assuming that we're in just the regular entry world, where he's an entrant and he's asked the question about past drug use, if he answered yes, what, in the government's view, happens next? A counselor officer, as we explained in our brief, would have to seek an admission from him, and that's a formal process that's laid out in the Foreign Affairs Manual that requires a series of steps. I mean, that gets into State Department information, which is not an issue in this case. But yeah, that's the process he would have to go through. It's not, he couldn't appear at an interview with a counselor officer and the counselor officer says to him, I understand you disclosed in your book, you use drugs. You can't come here unless you get a waiver. There is a formal process of seeking an admission according to the Foreign Affairs Manual. Right. And that applies if he answered yes to that question. That's correct, Your Honor. Okay. What if he had answered no? Then whoever is looking at his entrance materials wouldn't necessarily have known anything about past drug use and might have admitted him. Yes? That's possible, Your Honor. Yes. And in those circumstances, again, assuming this is hypothetically what's going on or what happened, is plaintiff right to suggest that the government has or should have here some duty to investigate whether that answer was correct in light of the Duke's book? I'm not. I'm assuming, hypothetically, the Duke, to enter the United States, answers no to the question. I'm not saying to enter. In connection with his entry to the United States, the Duke answers the question, no, to past drug use. He enters. He's in the United States. He's living here, according to his book. The book is then published, and it discloses from his perspective at least past drug use. In those circumstances, what, if anything, from the government's perspective should happen next? Well, the book isn't sworn testimony or proof that he used drugs. It's his recollection of events in his life that are presented in a way to sell books. Just by saying something is in a book doesn't make it true, and they can't necessarily go off a book. Right, so maybe the government couldn't conclude that. Again, in this hypothetical, the answer was untrue. But would the government normally, when presented with some evidence that an answer on an entry form was incorrect, seek to determine whether there had been an untrue statement made at entry? Your Honor, I'm not necessarily deeply familiar with that, those kinds of procedures that the State Department uses. But I would imagine so if they had some information that someone had made a false statement on an official form, that there would be an investigation. I know you said that there are possible ways he could have entered. Is it absolutely clear that the Duke is not a U.S. citizen? 
He has said he's not a U.S. citizen, Your Honor. Okay, but that's as clear as his other statements in the book. I mean, it's not a sworn admission. That's correct, yes. And we do have his, we've admitted, although we're not disclosing it, we've admitted that we have his information in various immigration files. If he were a U.S. citizen, his information wouldn't be in those files. Well, it depends when he became naturalized. That's true. Okay, so to just catalog the options you have at entry, and I don't really think there's any dispute that the Duke entered the United States at least in March of 2020, and then bought a house sometime thereafter and is now making California his residence. When the Duke entered in March 2020, if he answered yes on that form that he had to fill out to pass drug use, that would have required something of a counselor officer or someone else reviewing that form, and he would not have been permitted to enter, at least automatically right then. Fair? That's true, Your Honor, unless he has a diplomatic visa. Right. Okay. Let's put that to the side for a second. That's true unless, or in addition, he could seek a waiver, right? That's right. As a practical matter, how do those two things relate chronologically? Can one seek a waiver preemptively? My reading of the statute, Your Honor, and this is based on the text of the statute, is that a waiver is an option for someone who is otherwise deemed inadmissible. So my understanding, just based on the text of the statute, is you have to first go through the process of getting in through the normal channel. And if you are denied at the point, then you can petition, the statute says, the Secretary of State or the Attorney General for a waiver. I suppose that could have happened before, though, right? I mean, we're assuming that the relevant entry is March 2020. I guess hypothetically, at least, he could have tried to enter in 2019 or 2020, been denied, and then sought a waiver. Yes, hypothetically, that's possible. Right, but assuming that didn't happen, if he was, if he checked the box or whatever on the form in 2020 to pass drug use, then either the process you describe kicks off, a counselor officer seeks a formal admission that is of the kind that you articulate in your brief and or he seeks a waiver. That's correct, Your Honor. Okay, and then, of course, there's the diplomatic visa. So why doesn't the public have an interest in knowing which of those two routes the government took here? The public doesn't have an interest in knowing it. Well, there's a minimal public interest in knowing it because this is information on immigration status that courts have consistently found to be exempt information. I mean, it's similar in category to someone's health information or their education information. This is private, personal information. The other reason is Prince Harry is, or the Duke of Sussex, is one foreign national out of any number of foreign nationals who enter the United States legally every year. The insight into how, any insight that this would give to how the government handled Prince Harry's admission wouldn't be able to draw a broader, give the public a broader understanding of how the government conducts itself in processing admissions from foreign nationals who admit to drug use or high-profile individuals. I mean, it's definitely not the case, you would concede, that FOIA requests related to specific investigations or specific individuals can never be insufficiently subject to public interest to warrant disclosure. I mean, there's tons of cases where courts have held that, notwithstanding the fact that they are individual cases. The public's interest outweighs the private interests. Yeah. I admit, Your Honor, I wouldn't say that never, that that's never possible, but I would. This case is similar to a case called Property of the People versus Department of Justice, where your colleague, Judge Cooper, upheld a Glomar response from the FBI when the plaintiff had sought records regarding President Trump's interactions with the FBI prior to 2015. 
they found that President Trump's, from when he was a private citizen, his privacy interests outweighed any public interests that there may be in previous interactions he may have had with the FBI. And I would argue, if President Trump has a privacy interest in that kind of interaction with the government, Prince Harry's privacy interest is even greater. Because he was never a governmental official in this country, has never appeared on a ballot in this country. There's a much bigger public interest in an interaction with a would-be elected officer than there is with a member of the royal family of a foreign country. This is really not briefed by the parties, and it's just a reminder to me. Sometimes, if I recall correctly, parties with an interest in documents requested by a FOIA requester have an opportunity to make their view known about disclosure or not. You mean a reverse FOIA, Your Honor? Reverse FOIA, yeah. Is reverse FOIA available to such parties in the context of Exemption 6 and 7C? when we're talking about privacy versus public interest? Or is it just in the competitive harm context where it often is used? That's where we see it most commonly, Your Honor, in competitive harm. But it would certainly be available to people in Exemption 6 or 7C. But the government has the same obligation to protect Prince Harry's privacy as it would to protect anybody's privacy whose immigration records were being sought. What that means, I'm not suggesting it's outcome determinative, of course, but what that means is that, at least in theory, the Duke of Sussex would have had the opportunity and has had the opportunity to intervene here or to bring a suit, a reverse FOIA action, to preclude the production of the information on the grounds that he didn't want it produced. In theory, he would, Your Honor. Yeah, I'm not suggesting at all that that's a prerequisite to the government prevailing here. So I recognize the government's litigating position across cases, and I understand it. I've said this, that there's, of course, potential harm for disclosure of information in camera, whether declarations or otherwise. But why isn't this one of those cases where it might make the most sense for the government to at least tell me what the true set of facts is? Because while it's been nice to have that discussion with you without disclosing facts, because I don't know them, at least sometimes knowing the non-public facts helps me understand the strength of the privacy interests and to weigh against the public interests in what I then would at least know what was disclosed or would be disclosed. Well, Your Honor, as you alluded to, I mean, the ability to do an in-camera review is within your discretion, but you alluded to what I think was one of your earlier opinions, Judicial Watch versus Department of Justice, where you acknowledge the risks that come with information potentially getting out. Yes, that was classified information, and that was concerned about national security. Here, the concern would be different. The concern would be that, as always, when information is shared, it runs the risk of a disclosure of the very thing that is sought to be protected. And I'm not discounting the Duke's privacy interests. I'm just suggesting, you know, harm to national security seems to me a greater interest from inadvertent disclosure that the privacy interests that the government is asserting on the Duke's behalf. Well, many of these records, Your Honor, are law enforcement records. So there is a stigma associated with being mentioned in a law enforcement record. And plaintiffs didn't contest this, but one of the exemptions we argued was Exemption 7E, the law enforcement techniques exemption. So there is confidential law enforcement tools and techniques in these files that would be in anything we would produce in an in-camera review. Obviously, I've been asking a lot of questions, probably diverted you from the argument you wanted to make. Do you want to circle back to your core set of arguments? I apologize. That's fine, Your Honor. 
The public interest in this information, as I alluded to before, this is one individual who had interactions with the government. It's not going to allow people to draw broad conclusions. We understand that the Duke of Sussex is a public figure, but even a public figure has been found to have had their privacy interests that includes... I think to be fair, Heritage doesn't argue that Prince Harry has no privacy interests. Excuse me. The Duke of Sussex has no privacy interests in his immigration records. Their argument is that they're not very strong privacy interests in light of the book and how public a figure he both is and has made himself to be. So his privacy interests are lower in this information than they would be if they were yours, for example, because you're not a very public person, not in the same way. So it's not that he doesn't have privacy interests. Of course he does. I think plaintiff says. It's really that they are either at an ebb or at least much weaker than other people's. Well, these specifically are immigration records, and the government has cited multiple cases in its brief about the private nature of immigration records and about the fact that people who are public figures still maintain their privacy interests. The only case that plaintiff has really cited to the contrary is this Muchnick versus DHS case. Yes. In that case, the subject of the records was a sexually violent predator who had been credibly accused. He got off in the Irish courts on a technicality. So there was much higher public interest in that particular case than there is here with someone who admitted to using drugs. The plaintiffs haven't cited any cases that are similar to this one where they found, where a court has found, that a public figure does not have a privacy interest in his immigration records absent this one outrageous outlier of a case. And I don't mean outrageous in the opinion. I mean outrageous in the facts that they relied on to demonstrate public interest. But why isn't that case pretty similar to this one? I mean, no conviction there. As you said, tossed on statute of limitations, grounds, or whatever it was. The person goes through the waiver process, I guess, because of that claim. The court says the public's interest in knowing how it was that he was admitted outweighs his interest in not having his heretofore private immigration materials not disclosed. This seems pretty close to this case. Well, the subject in that case had been accused of sex crimes and had molested multiple young girls. This is someone who, in this case, is someone who, in a book, admitted to using some drugs. I mean, common sense dictates that the public would be more interested in how someone who is a credibly accused sexual predator is in the country versus someone who just admitted to using drugs. Really, I think maybe frame it a little bit differently. The public has more interest in your view in why the government admitted that guy than it does in knowing why the government admitted the Duke of Sussex. That's right, Your Honor. Given they're different. That's right. Because this is, of course, about shining a light, if appropriate, on government decision making. It's not about the public's interests prurient or otherwise in individual entrance. That's right, Your Honor. Anything else you'd like to add before I turn it over to the plaintiff's counsel and come back to you for rebuttal? Nothing else, Your Honor. We'll stay on the briefs for now. Thank you. Thank you. Counsel, Mr. Dewey? May I proceed, Your Honor? You may. Your Honor, in plaintiff's view, this is a case about whether the government provides special treatment for high-profile celebrities. The Duke repeatedly admitted at length to the elements of drug crimes, both here and abroad, in his autobiography. He admitted to daily drug use after he was admitted in March of 2020. The Duke sought entry to this country in March of 2020, as Your Honor has noted. As of January 2020, he was looking for a residence in Canada. His royal security was withdrawn in February of 2020. He thought about moving elsewhere. 
In March of 2020, the Duke and the Duchess formed an intent to leave Canada because of the closing border. Less than two weeks later, the Duke enters the country on March 14th to take up residence without any difficulty whatsoever. The Duke's admission make him inadmissible without, as your honor had noted, a waiver. As plaintiff's declarants explain, that it is complicated, lengthy, and technical process. And yet again, the Duke entered into less than two weeks. In plaintiff's submission, that set of facts raises profound questions about DHS's conduct. There is a profound public interest in understanding, one, whether or not DHS acted improperly, and that is the public interest under the Favish line. And the second, and Your Honor alluded to this, I think, earlier in discussions with my friend, is crew the third and fourth in our papers, which is understanding. How does DHS understand high-profile cases? And that line of cases, Your Honor, goes very directly to the point Your Honor made that if the profile is high enough, treatment of an individual suffices. Can we just go back to the first set of questions I asked the government? Because I think there's actually agreement on these propositions, notwithstanding, perhaps, and this is not to cast dispersions at all. But I think everyone agrees that when the Duke entered on March 14th, he was one of a few things had to be true. Either if he checked, if he did not check the box for past drug use, then maybe nothing would have happened with respect to that question, and he would have entered, at least possibly. If he checked the box for past drug use, then he should not have been entered immediately and a process should have commenced, either to learn more, perhaps to seek the kind of formal admission that we've been talking about, and or for him to seek a waiver to permit his entry. And then I think, at least hypothetically, there's the possibility that none of those questions gets asked because he's on a diplomatic visa. And I know your view of that. It seems to me that everyone agrees that those are the, that's sort of the suite of possible steps that could occur. I know I'm being very general, but do you see it any differently than I just articulated? We don't, Your Honor, with one technical exception. Yeah. And I think based on what the government said, I agree with you that that's now not in dispute. Your Honor asked if he can seek a waiver pre-admission. Yeah, you can. That's the form I-192, and it's a pretty lengthy form. To Your Honor's point, you have to explain the basis for seeking a waiver. Yeah. In this case, that would likely take a long time, as Mr. Saunders, one of our experts, points out. I read the reports. On March 14, 2020, if the Duke checked the box, yes, I've engaged in past drug use, either he would then have, from your perspective, to seek a waiver at the point, or he could have previously, but if he had previously sought a waiver, he would have had to disclose the past drug use and the reason for the waiver. Yes, Your Honor, broadly, with a couple technical caveats, if I may. Please. The first technical caveat is if he checks the form, the agents would be under a duty to examine him further. That is pretty basic. If they didn't do that, that would, quite frankly, be misconduct more egregious than we've alleged in our papers may well have occurred. That is in the reports, as Your Honor had noted. The second technical point is Your Honor asked if he could have a waiver previously. That possibility, I guess, theoretically, in the theoretical, could exist, but there are a number of factors in the record that indicate he probably wouldn't. First, prior entries as a working royal on government business, he could be on a Class A. 2015, he comes to see the president and he's traveling with the large Metropolitan Police security detail. We can see that for those trips, he might not have been asked the question because he's legitimately being sent by Her Majesty's government to do official work. As to the waiver in this instance, Your Honor, the waiver is only valid for the time length of the visa. 
to get a non-immigrant visa that lets you into the country for more than I'm going to see my friends, you would need to have some sort of basis, whether it's an O visa for special talent or a job visa. So you would have to have that set up in advance. Even if there was a prior waiver, the standard is going to be considered differently for I'm coming to go to a friend's wedding versus I'm living here. And that process would have been done again. So I guess that triggers a question that I've meant to ask before, and that is, does a citizen of the UK or in what circumstance does a citizen of the UK need a visa to enter the United States or did as of March 2020? Your Honor, as of March 2020, a citizen could have entered using a visa waiver process, which lets you in for 90 days. You just can't conduct business. However, there's a question on that about the drug use. Okay, so that does. And there's examples in our papers, Your Honor, where people checked yes, and in one case, a high-profile individual was pulled off the plane. So really, unless you are on a diplomatic visa, if you're a citizen of the UK seeking to enter the United States in March 2020, you have to either answer the question, have you used drugs in the past, or have a waiver that applies to the visit that we're talking about. Correct. Okay, got it. Yana, a couple of questions you asked my friend that I want to attempt to provide some insight on. Please. The admissions process that my friend referred to applies only to a custodial process. We cited cases in our papers, admittedly from the Ninth Circuit, holding it does not apply. For example, the context of a psychiatric examination. Spare is a valid admission. It's an admission by a party opponent. If the Duke were here and I were examining him, as your honor knows, it comes in. Indeed, the Duke confirmed the accuracy of passages in spare under cross-examination in the high court in an unrelated manner. And I would be happy to provide your honor with that transcript if it would be helpful on that point. Your honor asked about reverse. It seems to me that the dispute between the parties about what is quote unquote admission isn't all that relevant to me. I understand the point. I agree, Your Honor. I'm just trying to provide Your Honor with some technical clarity. Yep. I don't think it really matters for our purposes. Yeah. Your Honor, you asked about reverse FOIA. Under reverse FOIA, in the Supreme Court's opinion, you would need a statutory bar to disclosure because most FOIA exemptions are discretionary. The only applicable statutory bar to disclosure under the law I've seen would be the Privacy Act, but that would apply to a citizen or lawful permanent resident. However, the Duke still could seek to intervene as a right or leave from your honor to answer that question. As to the Exemption 7E point, I just wanted to clarify for your honor that we reserved on those exemptions asserted. We didn't think we were going to challenge them. We didn't think we were going to contest redaction of names. But we don't know until we don't know what the GLOMAR stands for. I recall the lines in your brief. For example, you know, the GLOMAR is accurate. Then we don't have to take up some of these other issues. But if you can't GLOMAR the question, then we may have some issues. I recall that. Absolutely, Your Honor. Let's just assume, hypothetically, that there is really just a couple of ways that Prince Harry gets in and, excuse me, the Duke of Sussex gets in, and that let's just assume, hypothetically, that there's either a public interest in understanding how the government went about reaching those conclusions, or perhaps even more, there's a question about whether the government acted improperly. And I have to waive those public interests against the privacy interest here. What standard am I applying other than just, like, making it up? What guidance is there, really, other than looking to concrete cases that have particular outcomes? Your Honor, I can give you concrete cases that have outcomes. I can give you Muchnik, which I think is on all fours. And I'll circle back to that in a moment, Your Honor. An out-of-circuit district court opinion. Correct. That's the only opinion we could find in these circumstances, and you can take what you have. 
As to the broader question, we've cited factors some of your colleagues have looked to in the brief. Press interests, government interests, whether or not the information is necessary to provide the transparency. In some instances, there will be a public interest, but the information might be cumulative. And your colleagues said, well, you don't need it there, which obviously is not the case here or in a vacuum, as your honor has pointed out. Some courts have looked to, is it per se involving criminal conduct? Not the case here. This is the Codrea opinion where I think Judge Contreras did a very good job of attempting to glean factors, as your honor pointed out. I can't give you a DC circuit opinion. I can't give you an out of circuit opinion. I can only give you those district court opinions that cycle through the facts. Yeah. One other addition I would like to make, your honor is I don't think your honor, your honor could reach that question. I don't think your honor will need to hear because I think the government has conceded that point. Which point? The balancing of the interests. If you assume the public interests we've cited, they did not respond at all to the argument we cross-moved. Well, I mean, it seems to me that a fair amount of the government's brief is to argue the Duke has a very heightened privacy interest. And the implication of that is to say, I think, I will hear from the government, I suppose, in rebuttal. Even if you spot that there is some interest in knowing how the government went about its business here, because I don't think they say they definitely do not concede or assume for purposes of argument that there's been a showing of government impropriety. But I do think that they argue that the balancing always has to tip in favor of non-disclosure because of the very heightened privacy interests. I think that's probably right, Your Honor. I was referring to the specific parsing of the factors, and obviously that's within Your Honor's discretion. All right, so fill in the blank then. The public's interest in what the government's up to or alleged government impropriety outweighs Prince Harry's privacy interests supplying X standard. Yeah, and here we have, we would submit a very significant public interest, which is the public interest on the Favish. It's the most potent public interest. I can give you that from court and from the D.C. Circuit. I think you start out with the public interest as not a loading of the dice per se. The side of the scale is heavy. It's very heavy. I think you would then ask the factors we went through. How does the media see this? Some courts have looked to that. I think the answer, you know, the media is here. They're interested. We filed those papers. They may be interested because it's the due, not because they are that interested in what the government was up to. I can't ascribe the motive. I can just say some courts have looked to as the case reported. Your Honor can certainly draw that distinction, and I can't contest that sitting here today. I'm just going off the factors that are there. Understood? There has been some congressional interest, Your Honor, and you can look to that. I think it is significant that here there is no other way to get the information. That has been a very significant factor in the balancing that other district courts have looked to. I think it's relevant that this is not criminal conduct and that that's relevant on the privacy side of the scale, Your Honor. Right. Because there are cases where I can't remember what the name of the case is, which case it is. I think it's the title opinion where in the context of a death penalty case, the information sought related to I guess additional indicia of additional criminal behavior by the four potential other murderers. And the D.C. Circuit said that still is a pretty significant privacy interest to not disclose whether the government, what the government did with respect to those people in sort of a criminal investigation sense. But, of course, the D.C. Circuit nevertheless held that the public interest in knowing how the government investigated an alternative set of murders in a capital case would outweigh those privacy interests. Your Honor, the case is Roth that Your Honor is thinking of. So let me just flip it around, maybe make it a more positive statement. 
because of his admissions, if it were now disclosed that he had applied for a waiver, that really wouldn't add much to the public's knowledge about him and his conduct because he's already made public the underlying facts that would make a waiver application necessary. Correct, Your Honor. That is precisely it. And I think there's plenty of law to follow on that. The weight of that, the Steele dossier case, I think is a good example of that. There's so much out there that how much does this really add to the calculus? Not much, a related point. So let me ask you this question then. Doesn't that, and I mean, I know you're probably in favor of this to some extent, but doesn't that counsel in favor of my getting from the government an in-camera submission, ex part in-camera submission, so that I would know whether, for example, what would be disclosed was a waiver application because disclosure of a waiver application would be to disclose a set of facts about the Duke, maybe many of which are kind of already public in the sense we've been talking about. But if instead the materials reflected some other thing, maybe it wouldn't. Maybe the disclosure of that information would not disclose materials that are already known. Completely agree, Your Honor. We have no objection to any in-camera procedure that Your Honor would like to pursue. The government actually volunteered in-camera review in Muchnik. And I think, Your Honor, we cited in our cases brief other cases where some of your colleagues said, well, let me see the documents because that will kind of settle the question. We all cited the Phillips case from SDNY, where the judge there thought there was a favish issue, but looked at the documents and said, well, there's nothing in here that informs this. So that really moots out the party's dispute. We have no problem with that. We think it's absolutely appropriate in this case, Your Honor, should Your Honor want to look at the material. Obviously, plaintiff's position is we should prevail without even getting to that step. I understand. But if Your Honor wants to do it, we have no objection and think it would be extremely prudent. If I can, on the privacy interests, Your Honor, I know we're talking at a high level of generality, the basic core issues. We would note that we think the declarations on that issue have problems under D.C. Circuit law and Your Honor's recent opinion in Padres They don't really get into some of the details Your Honor and I were just discussing. For example, taking the GLOMAR of the 212D3A waiver, they don't really assess, well, what it is, the additional harm to the privacy interests and disclosure of the information in light of the tableau of what we know. They don't address, well, what is the actual mechanism of concrete harm in knowing the visa class, for example? None of that is addressed. I understand Your Honor's questions, and going directly to the core issue, I just want to flag that this is a live issue as well. Right. I did want to circle back to Munchnik, Your Honor, because it's a district court case from out of district, but I do think that it is the only case Your Honor is correct to address similar circumstances. It feels like the closest case that I've seen. We have exhaustively reviewed the cases. Yeah, and that is the closest we've been able to find. I just wanted to respond briefly to the government submissions. The fact that one is accused regardless of how credibly of sexual abuse is actually not a ground to deny admission, depending on how one's coming in. It is, it could in theory be used discretionarily, but it's not an actual ground for admission. And therefore, we would submit that this case is actually more egregious than Muchnik because we have a... Let me just pause you there to be a very lay person about it, maybe. Does that mean that if someone is a UK citizen, or I can't remember if he was Ireland or UK, but whatever, assuming a UK citizen is credibly accused of a sexual assault crime and not prosecuted, and then appears for admission in the US, is there a box on the form that person has to check yes or no to. Yes, probably as to previous law enforcement encounters. 
Think of, I know your honor has done a clearance review. Think of that. Have you ever been arrested? Okay. That same type of question, your honor. Encounters with law enforcement. Yes. There was an issue in Muchnik as to whether he was truthful on a subsequent application for citizenship, but he was truthful on the initial application. We know that from the opinion, and that is not a per se ground of inadmissibility. You could investigate it, decide someone is not a sufficient character. That is purely discretionary. It is not a per se ground of inadmissibility like we are talking about here. As to the realm of the public interest, we would submit there is a public interest to understand. Is DHS engaging in favoritism? This is not a new issue in this space. This has been brought up before with other cases. Has DHS engaged in preferential treatment for high-profile individuals with these types of issues? So we really do think that the government's distinction, well, he was credibly accused, doesn't really cut any water. And if anything, we are more reliant on that. And we do think that, you know, if your honor follows Judge Breyer's opinion, that we do prevail. If I can just circle back to another technical point. We do think there is an issue that the department has not at all controverted the expert reports. And we think at the summary judgment stage, once those are in, there needs to be some contravention of those reports of some sort. Well, to the extent they are statements of law. Understand, Jana. That's my Bollywick. To the extent that they purport to weigh public and private interests, that's my Bollywick. To the extent that they are statements about practice and the like, 100%. They are in the record. They are uncontroverted from my perspective. Correct. We think it's a problem for the government, Your Honor. That, that significantly weighs in favor. Which part? Not the last part, Your Honor. Indicated to the extent those statements are uncontroverted and in the record. No, 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 no. For example... The difficulty of obtaining the waiver, the waiver process, the types of examinations they go through. I know Mr. Saunders talks about some of his other high-profile clients. I haven't really heard the government to argue that it is easy to get a waiver. Understood, Your Honor. I just want to clarify that from our perspective, that's undisputed and that cuts in our favor. I don't know if they've taken a position on that. Fair enough. I think that's just undergirds the public interest that there really is in our case under Favish, where we need to know more. Favish is not insurmountable. We've given the court the relative quote. It's less than overcoming good faith. Right. We think that we've overcome that clearly here when you, as your honor has done, carefully look at the facts that are in the record and then draw the appropriate conclusions from them. With that, your honor, unless the court has any other questions, I'm happy to rest for now. Yes, thank you. I'll give you an opportunity for sir rebuttal if necessary. Thank you, your honor. Of course. Mr. Bardo, I'm happy to hear from you on anything you'd like to address. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Dewey talked extensively about the National Archives versus Favish case. They haven't met the burden under Favish to demonstrate a potential government impropriety. There is a line in the opinion that says government impropriety is easy to allege but difficult to prove. As we've discussed in my first go-around here, there are multiple lawful ways or several lawful ways in which the Duke could have been admitted into the United States. Getting through any of those ways does not demonstrate any kind of government impropriety. Wait, just to go back, the multiple lawful ways are what? Yes, waiver and diplomatic visa. But the plaintiff says it's absurd to think that he has a diplomatic visa and a waiver takes a long time, and you haven't disputed that. 
No, they also have no evidence that he didn't go through the waiver process and go through the long waiver process years in advance. That's true. But it seems in light of the book somewhat unlikely that that happened, don't you think? That's the way he characterizes it in a book that's meant for a commercial audience. It's not necessarily the full story. But you agree, then, that other than having a diplomatic visa and going through the waiver process, other than those two options, the only way the Duke could have entered would have been to lie on the form. Well, it's possible that a consular officer just may not have sought an admission, but that's unlikely. Right? The likely ways he could have been admitted are diplomatic visa, waiver, light on the form. Yes, that's right, Your Honor. That's really the universe. Yes. But plaintiff says each of those things raises a red flag. Diplomatic visa, I'm just putting words in plaintiff's mouth, is kind of preposterous to consider given the current relationship between the Duke and the family. So that's diplomatic visa. Waiver, the problem with waiver is they have experts that are unrebuted that say it takes a really long time. So you have to imagine that that process, if it was to work to allow him to enter in March of 2020, had to start before that. But that seems highly inconsistent with how he articulates what they did in the book from Canada, COVID, January, February 2020 through March 2020. Yeah. And so, if he sought a waiver and was granted very quickly, plaintiff says that would be anomalous and could imply preferential treatment. Then the third option, the third primary option, is he didn't check the box. He didn't admit to drug use. And if that's the world we're in, plaintiff says, well, okay, he entered, but then the government should have done something thereafter because it is highly public admissions to suggest that the form was inaccurate. And the government typically, when it gets wind of people who lied on their immigration forms, does something about it. And if the government hasn't done anything here, that's also at least a red flag. So what is your responses to that suite of, I'll put it this way, the suite of red flags that plaintiff raises in response to the options you've articulated? Sure. Well, with respect to lying on the form, I mean, that goes through various levels of speculation. They have no factual basis or any basis to believe that he got in that way and that the government is somehow pulling its punches for somebody who lied on a form. Doesn't that mean that it's then the very likely scenario here is that he sought a waiver? I wouldn't say it's very likely. I mean, it's most likely. I wouldn't say that either. I mean, it's possible for him to have a diplomatic visa. He is still a member of the British royal family and still has the title Duke of Sussex. I know he's formally stepped down from his roles, but he is still a government official in the United Kingdom by his birth and by his title. Does he have a privacy interest in the fact that he holds a diplomatic visa? Yes, he does. As a matter of fact, that would be, we would be prohibited from disclosing that because that's visa information. I cited the statute in my brief. Yeah. Courts have found that Exemption 3 would apply in that circumstance. Okay. That would be in the State Department's custody. Right. The visa, the materials around a diplomatic visa, of course, are principally resided at state. I get that. If someone submitted to DHS or to state, I'm not trying to make this about the relevant agency question. Does the Duke of Sussex presently have a diplomatic visa? Would the government Glomar that or have to respond to that? 
What's that? Well, FOIA doesn't require the government to answer interrogatories, so if there were... Sorry? You're right. Disclose to us records relating to any diplomatic visa held by the Duke of Sussex. Right. They should have to glomar that, and they would be able to cite Exemption 6 as well as Exemption 3. Okay. I read, perhaps incorrectly, read plaintiff's brief to suggest that there is no privacy interest in a diplomatic visa because it's diplomatic. Uh, That is not correct, Your Honor. Okay, okay. It still statutes prohibit us from disclosing that information. All right, I... Again, took you off the argument you're presenting. You're talking about Favish. Yes, in the last part that I was going to address with Favish, nothing that the plaintiffs have submitted in these declarations really add additional insight into what's already in the briefs or what's already publicly known. They have no basis to contend that Prince Harry didn't go through the process ahead of time and that he didn't go through a rigorous examination by a counselor officer followed by the process that's required for a waiver. And even the declarants that plaintiff submitted, even they say that there are no set written standards necessarily to obtain a waiver. So it's difficult to understand how they could allege government impropriety in handling a case that, in making a decision where there isn't necessarily clear written standards where there's a lot of discretion. But you agree that for Prince Harry to enter on March 14, 2020, pursuant to a waiver, at least standard protocol would have required that the waiver be teed up earlier than that day because otherwise it would normally take long. That's probably correct, Your Honor. Okay, got it. Anything else you would like to add, Counsel? Oh, yeah, that's it, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dewey? One moment, Your Honor. Take your time. Yana, very quickly on the diplomatic visa question. Yeah? The Class A visa, unless it were the king himself, wouldn't permit work. And we know the Duke is working here. If that was the case, there would be a pretty substantial red flag there. And that's in the author declaration, paragraph 14, note 1 in Appendix A. Second, Yana. And this is on page three of the appendix to the author declaration. It lists the requirement documentation. Plaintiff submission is the visa material may be covered by that statute. It hasn't been asserted here. But there's a diplomatic note that is required to get the visa. And that is a note that says he is coming over because he's a diplomat. He's coming over because he's traveling on behalf of Her Majesty the Queen to meet the president and do good work. We would submit that note is not actually going to be covered because it's not solely part of the visa issuance or refusal process. In our reply at page 11, we cite one of your colleagues' opinion in the Darnbro case, which says that exemption is narrowly applied. So our submission, whatever the interests in the do I have diplomatic visa or not, there is no privacy interest in am I here as a diplomat? Am I here on behalf of His Majesty the King? I would think that would be an appropriate question to be put to the government in the abstract. What about the possibility? This is to sort of go back a little bit. I mean, to where you started. It's at least hypothetically possible that the Duke could have entered on a diplomatic visa and then applied for a different visa. And in connection with the application for a non-diplomatic visa, where he now has some time, he's here. He says, you know what? I've decided I want to stay. And he stays. 
but I'm probably not going to be a diplomat anymore, and I want to be a regular old visa entrant. As a technical matter, if he was in status, he could apply for another visa. Again, Your Honor, we go back to, we think, the diplomatic note. There would be something in the DHS file reflecting that status. I can't point you to a case, but we would submit there's no privacy interest. The thing about that, it means that there is, there's at least this possibility, if he doesn't have a diplomatic visa on March 14, 2020, obviously he's applying not as a diplomat, and he has to check the box and get a waiver. And that takes some time. But if he has a diplomatic visa at that time, enters, and then hypothetically applies for a waiver, then the lengthy process your experts talk about isn't something that has to happen on March 14th. It just has to happen before his visa converts to a different visa. That would be correct on your honors hypothetical. If I might step back for a moment, though. Please. As to that entry, if he somehow had a valid diplomatic visa, normally it would only be issued for the trip. It might not allow him to remain. It would be an abuse to use that to enter, Your Honor, because he was not entering for a diplomatic purpose. At that time, January 18th is the so-called Sandringham Statement. The Queen takes him back. He doesn't have any official duties at that point. In February, his security is pulled, Your Honor. We would submit it. Would be extraordinary anomalous for Her Majesty's government to withdraw official security, yet permit someone to enter as a diplomat or as a government official on a government mission. Yeah. Again, absent the king himself, the Class A visa, you can't come here and work. And that would be a bigger red flag if I want to be careful if I'm articulating this correctly. That may have happened, but when the agent was admitting him and saw he's coming in on a Class A visa, when the whole world knows he's no longer a working royal, that would, in and of itself, raise a profound red flag of what in the world is happening that someone can come in on that visa, which would not be appropriate for that class of entry. Again, Your Honor, and I apologize for the confusion to brief because it's a fine point. The visa statute is narrowly drawn on your colleague's opinion. Our submission is that the communications from the British government saying the Duke of Sussex has an official role and that's why he's coming in, or the Duke of Sussex is an accredited, credible diplomat. That communication should be responsive. It would be in the DHS file somewhere. It's relevant. We would submit that's not covered by the statute, and you don't have a privacy issue absent an extraordinary national security consideration in saying, I'm on official business, or I'm here as an accredited diplomat. The brief was clear. I was sort of elevating it to a higher level of generality. I think what I really trying to explore was the, I mean, obviously it seems unlikely that the Duke is still on a diplomatic visa for all the reasons you've articulated. What I was really just exploring was whether there was a possibility that he was on one when he entered and then converted later in a way that would make working acceptable on the new visa, whereas it wouldn't be on the diplomatic visa and the like. He could have done that, Your Honor. He was working pretty quickly when he was here and he was residing here. And then again, we think letting him in on that visa without taking a step back and saying, wait a minute, this is quite odd. Right. What is going on here? That, that would in and of itself be a red flag. And I think the declarants are pretty clear on that, Your Honor. And that's why they both discounted that possibility in their analysis. 
Got it. Unless the court has any other questions, I wanted to clarify that point, but I'm happy to take any other questions. Oh, no, no. I think I have it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Bardo, any last word? Don't need to? Nothing else, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. So, first of all, thank you for the strong briefs and argument today. I'm going to take the matter under advisement, as I often do in highly disputed, somewhat complicated summary judgment contexts. My taking it under advisement is to both the ultimate questions and, to some extent, the predicate question of whether I think I should look at some information ex part in camera. I haven't even decided that that's necessary. I think if I were to do so, I would decide that pretty quickly and I would ask the government to make a submission. I understand the government's argument that even if I do that, I should in the first instance, permit or accept declarations rather than the underlying materials. Frankly, that's my view generally because it's often the case that the underlying documents aren't all that easily decipherable without explanation, and sometimes the declarations help that. So I will take the matter under advisement, and you will hear from me. You will probably hear from me if I do want something in camera. You'll probably hear from me pretty soon, okay? Thank you all. And that's how we have arrived to this point in which the court ordered that on or before March 24, the defendant, meaning DHS, shall submit to the court in camera a declaration or declarations that detail with particularity the records it is withholding and the particular harm that would arise from public disclosure of them. Defendant may supplement its declarations with any materials it deems appropriate. So as you can see, folks, they smell or the judge smells something very fishy going on and would like to get to the bottom of it. So I think it's going to get spicy. But what do you guys think? I think that he did come over here on his diplomatic visa, and I think he had it up until the year, I want to say, Rumspringer that... Meghan and Harry were on over here, whether it be to help the Biden administration win the election and then they would reevaluate their status. And I think that's when, in 2021, when Harry's diplomatic visa may have been pulled away. I think that's why he ended up getting that job with Better Up around the same time all this went down. I'm going to put money on it now that we're going to find out that. Harry didn't tell the truth. Now, would any of us be shocked or, you know, be in disbelief over that? No, I think a lot of us suspect that the lies that they told began from day one and the dates that they gave for when they moved over to the United States most likely is not accurate. Let's not forget that Harry and Meghan were flying to the United States coming to Miami to give a speech for J.P. Morgan. Then they were at Stanford in California visiting the tech giants to set up their censorship gig. They were here before they actually moved to the United States. So it would be interesting to understand were they flying over here on a diplomatic visa? My guess is yes. I think that they were coming over here to do work or quote-unquote work for the Queen. Maybe the Queen didn't know, but maybe that's what Harry told him he was doing. It's going to be interesting to see, but what do you guys think? Definitely leave your thoughts below. As always, I will be back with more content, but until then, please be safe, and I will talk to you later. Bye! Such a broad. Huh?